Hey folks, I'm Grimwit from NatchEvil.com and this is Natchean News. Very important. Until something changes, I will no longer be doing these podcasts after this December. We are still making them until December. I've already made promises that I would finish up this year of Oral Send. The plan was that each season would be a different year of the town. But let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a voice actor. And I'm at the point in my life where I need to start playing to my strengths. Until someone that can do better than my voice, which is not hard, volunteers for season two, I'm just going to have to put this project away. Instead, I'll be focusing on the World Sin Gate comic, which I sort of left by the wayside to do other projects. It's its own beast, however. On a side note, if you would like to volunteer for a regular weekly World Sin Gate reading, send me an audition. My email is natchevil at gmail.com. This week's Let's Play will be Minecraft with just a snippet of Blood Bowl. You'll, you'll find out. I, it's awesome. Today's guest voice is Sarento. So without furthermore, let's dig into Whirlson Gate. Whirlson Gate. Episode 11. Room 402. By Mike Rojas. Special guest voice, Sarento. Along with Evil Seedlet. April. 1916, The Wordless Hotel on Ravenlove Street. Grace tumbled backwards and pushed herself against the wall, opposite of the violent ripping in front of her. She muffled a scream behind her hand and pounded the floor, searching for her cane. After mussing about with the bed, the dresser, the picture, and the door, this was too much for her. The young girl planted her foot and cane firmly on the floor and beat it from room 402 before the wallpaper finished tearing. Outside, she crashed into Felix Gregerson. Back then, he still had eyes. Young lady, are you all right? This is too much. I I have to get out of here. It's too much, I say. In tears, she hobbled to the stairs and descended. Felix leaned into the room, careful not to make a sound. Other than Grace's lamp on the floor, the room seemed quite tranquil. That is, until Felix saw the writing on the wall. It was huge, jagged letters carving out the words, Just leave already. The bed made a huge squeak as some invisible bulk fell on top, and then the picture tipped on the wall. Felix shut the door from the hall. Well, he said, no one's going to stay there for a long while. April, 1921. The Wordless Hotel on Ravenlove Street. Sure, room 402 is quiet. John Davis said, tapping his ledger. Look, I keep track of all strange phenomena in my hotel, and no one's left any notes next to this entry. Big Jim, half man, half mountain, squinted at the document before shrugging and speaking in his unusually high-pitched voice. Well, I guess. His pickle-sized fingers grasped the tiny pen and signed next to the room number. It'll be good to get away from my house, you know, John? Sometimes Brutus really gets on my nerves. I left him home. I think he's stuck on the kitchen counter now. I still have Cy, though. I don't want to know. I'd just like to get back to my book. John thought for a moment. Wait, who Bruce? My meat cleaver? I don't want to know. Now this isn't like last time. The last room I got here was room 207. Both Jim and John took a moment to shudder. Room 207 had been very unpleasant. No one's allowed to stay there anymore. Look. John pointed again at the ledger. I'm serious. Part of the reason I inherited this hotel was to record all the little quirks of these rooms. Nothing, I repeat, nothing is wrong with room 402. Big Jim was skeptical. He looked hard at John, then at the ledger, then back at John. Finally, he nodded affirmatively and grabbed his bag for the climb upstairs. John Davis was deep into his archive of The World Sender, the only local newspaper. 
when he heard Big Jim march downstairs in his pajamas. Checking his watch, John saw only thirty minutes had passed. Jim took a deep breath and said, The room is haunted. No, it isn't, John declared. Yes, it is. There's a ghost in my room. No one who has stayed in that room has reported any ghost. It's not haunted. How far back does that ledger go, John? Hmm, back to when I took over the hotel, so... John flipped to the beginning of his record. 1918? Turning to a cabinet behind him, the hotel manager began flipping through his old files and folders. He pulled out a slightly larger ledger with crumbling corners and musty pages. Dust billowed forward as he sped through the old archive of tenants, settling long after John had found the page he was looking for. Huh. He said, finger under Grace Caselot's name. The room's haunted. On the outside, room 402 was relatively harmless. With its purple door and brass plate, it could have been mistaken for any other room on that floor. The instant Jim and John entered the room... The door closed with no warning or help. That's not right, John said, scratching his head. Is it just the door? No, the bed keeps making itself, too, answered Big Jim. He walked across the simple room and pulled the covers up, then placed them into a pile. The two stood and watched the blankets. In less than a minute, an invisible entity threw them on the floor and carefully put them back onto the bed in an orderly fashion. John Davis crossed his arms and thought. Maybe we're being haunted by housekeeping. He reached over to a picture of a tower built on Mason Lake and tipped it crooked. Let's see. It didn't take long for the picture to right itself. Huh. I didn't start it either, Jim said, sitting on the bed. I was just about to sleep when the door opened and shut. Something pulled the sheets away from me and here we are. Just a moment. John left the room, the door closing behind him on its own. He went to the room across the hall, room 403, and messed up the bed. Nothing happened, except that John had turned solid purple, but that was just the room. Everything in 403 turned solid purple. The bed, however, stayed a mess. He tipped the picture crooked, and it stayed crooked. Room 403 was not haunted. Upon returning, and therefore becoming his normal color again, John found Big Jim opening his dresser drawer. It closed on its own. Jim would open the drawer, and it would close again. It doesn't seem dangerous, John said. Can you sleep with it tonight? No, I can't sleep. It keeps trying to push me off the bed. At first it tried to make the bed on top of me, but then it just threw a fit and tossed a lamp at me. Can't I change rooms? And mess up my ledger? John was indignant. That's written in ink, you know. I'll just add ghost to the notes and we'll get you a new room tomorrow. Maybe we can get rid of the ghost. John raised an eyebrow. How? Hmm. Let's see if we can communicate with it then. Where can we get a medium at this time of night? Nah, let's just make a mess it can understand. Jim got up and opened his drawer, pulling out a long evil looking knife named Sai. Let's cut something. Sai said to Jim, Let's cut it deep. Yeah, okay, Jim said to the knife. He stabbed the blade deep into the wall and pulled down, destroying the plaster and wallpaper. John pulled his own hair in disbelief. What? No! What are you doing? Communicating with the dead, Jim said. He slashed a deep J, followed by a U, S, and T. My wall! My beautiful wall! John vainly tried to wrestle Jim's arm away. Stop it! Just a little more, Jim said. John Davis heard a sharp thud behind him and twirled in place. It was something scraping on the floor. I think you're pissing it off, he said. Something knocked on the corner of the room while John continued to carve. There was a muffled scream. Then suddenly the door flew open and footsteps could be heard flying into the hall. There, Jim said, admiring his work. I think that's done it. The words he cut into the wall couldn't be plainer English. It read, Just leave already, in large, jagged letters. Jim jumped onto the bed with a loud squeak. Is it gone? John asked. He tipped the painting again. Nothing happened. I think it's gone. After John had left, the door shut gently on its own.
If you like World Syngate or Natchy News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly-doo if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will be gone forever. Just like everyone you know and love in time. Nothing is permanent, silly monkey. Not even your soul. Super thanks goes to Evil Seelit for her voice work. If you like Evil Seelit's voice, she's got a YouTube channel. Music for this show was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. And Burma, the radio song from the beginning, was taken from archive.org. Seedlets, McLeods, and cool old-timey music links can be found in the description below. This episode's noun was Big Jim. Leave a comment suggesting your favorite person, place, or thing from this episode, and I will include it in the next episode, forming a chain of nouns. Have nothing but fun, YouTubers. Have nothing but fun.